So when we chant the Namotasa um, before the Dhamma talk, then that's usually just the person who's doing the Dhamma teaching that recites the Namotasa um, rather than everybody. Unless you want to do the Dhamma talk instead. <coughs> Namo tasa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasa Namo tasa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasa Namo tasa bhagavato Arahato Samma Sambhutasa Bhutang Dhammang Sankhang Namasami We've been together for a, a day. Might feel like a lot longer. Perhaps, perhaps not. But um, during the, the course of uh, the first day of a meditation retreat, and as was uh, uh, suggested by a number of the questions uh, this afternoon, one of the things that uh, we uh, easily encounter, or people commonly encounter, um, is the mind doing a lot of thinking often uh, just the effort it takes to wrap up all of the the uh, everyday affairs and concerns getting everything um, sorted out and arranged so you can go away and be peaceful often the, the very effort to tidy everything up and get away and do all the traveling makes you more stressed than you normally would be <coughs> so that um, the, uh, often the effect of, of uh, getting to the retreat and then suddenly being in a quiet place and uh, watching the mind being with the activity of the mind it's, it can be quite shocking the amount of thinking that the mind uh, can, uh, can easily do I don't know if many of you noticed, but uh, this evening there was no um, wedding music <laughs> to decorate the air uh, while we had our evening meditation. And perhaps uh, the, um, the mind was so busy uh, creating thoughts that you, you didn't even have a, enough space in there to notice, oh, no, uh, no wedding music this evening. I wonder, what, wonder what's happening. So I thought it would be useful to talk a little bit about conceptual proliferation and how the mind gets filled with all that chattering uh, as, uh, as it does. Perhaps this is not the case for some of you. You have minds that are naturally uh, quiet or you've been meditating for so many years that your, your minds are easily silence, or if so, sadhu, sadhu. I feel very happy for you. But uh, as was uh, uh, our friend here in the front row was saying, uh, his mind is still in the um, ceaseless chattering phase. And that's often the case for many of us, particularly the first day of a retreat. But in uh, the Pali language, the word for conceptual proliferation is papancha <coughs> and uh, um, I'm sure it uh, exists in various forms in, in Hindi and in other Indian languages I'm sure it's probably one of those words that has carried on in various different ways uh, because it, it's a um, literally means uh, something like you know, complication and um, complication and confusion, pro uh, proliferation, <coughs> prolixity is another good word. The, um, uh, <coughs> the mind making too much of things, and uh, in that 
too muchness in that, in that, that extra of overabundant activity and it creates complication and distortion and, and confusion. So there's a very uh, a significant sutta a teaching where the Buddha speaks about this. Um, but, and uh, it's uh, interesting that the Buddha speaks quite briefly on this and then it's uh, the Venerable Mahakachana, one of the great Arahant disciples, who then um, gives the main discourse. This is called the Madhu Pindaka Sutta, the sweet morsel or the honey ball. Madhu, still honey, right? Pindaka, the Pinda, is in Pindabata, uh, the lump or ball, so it means the, the honey ball or the sweet morsel. And it has that name because at the end, Ananda, as he often was, was was really enthusiastic. So this is amazing. This is a wonderful teaching. This is delectable. This is delightful. This is like a sweet morsel, like a, 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 a madhu pindika. Uh, what should we call this discourse? And also, and the Buddha said, "Well, let's call it the madhu pindika sutta, <laughs> the sweet morsel, uh, or the, the honey ball." So it starts off with the Buddha sitting in the forest by himself and a uh, Brahmin pundit whose profession was debating you know, um, probably still happens today in India um, where for the, maybe for a wedding or a family event you, you know, for the entertainment rather than having a movie or a band come along you'd have two philosophers to come along and have a debate people could enjoy the, uh, the philosophical argument as a sort of um, Amusement for the crowd, uh, and uh, it's here two uh, two pundits arguing with each other and splitting hairs over fine philosophical points. So, according to the story, this was uh, this particular Brahmin pundit who was called Dandapani uh, was a professional debater of this this kind. So he's, he was um, passing through this forest, and he saw the Buddha sitting under a tree and thought, aha, you know, here's um, the, uh, the Samana Gotama, he, he's a um, spiritual leader, spiritual teacher, yeah, and uh, I'll, uh, I'll go and challenge him and um, we'll, get, we'll have a, a good debate and I'll uh, have the opportunity to show him up uh, how weak and inconsistent his philosophy is. This kind of train of thought was in his mind. So uh, Dandapani came along and, and uh, stood in front of the Buddha. The Buddha was just sitting meditating under the tree. So Dandapani came along and got the Buddha's attention and, um, and so challenged him. So, uh, so uh, honored sir, uh, what kind of uh, spiritual method do you practice? What sort of philosophy uh, do, you, do you follow? What's your, what's your teaching? And the Buddha said, the, uh, um, I follow the form of practice uh, that, uh, that involves non-contention with anyone or anything in the world. And so then Dandapani had no response to that. <laughs> I practice not contending with anyone or anything in the world. Over to you. Guruji. And so, uh, as it says in the Sutta, there, there's, a, there's a kind of subtle sort of humor that goes through the Pali Canon, but if you, don't, if you don't know how to look, you miss the jokes. But uh, in there, it says that uh, the, um, Dandapani's brow formed into three furrows, puckered into three furrows, and he clicked his tongue, went away, uh, frustrated, and... and um, and annoyed, but with nothing to say. So then when the Buddha got back to the monastery, um, he gave the uh, Sangha a brief account of this uh, um, conversation that had, that had happened that day. And uh, he said it's because of uh, attachment to our perceptions that this is the uh, the cause of people taking up weapons and uh, attacking each other is the cause of all of the um, 
the difficulty, the strife, the argument in the world. And then he walked off and went into his kuti and sort of left them there. So they, so he told he he told them this and um, made this this statement. It's uh, about you know, the attachment, identification with perceptions. Attachment to perceptions is the cause of all arguments in the world. And then you know, he walked off. So they thought, well, this is a really important theme. This is that the, the master has not said very much. So. What can we do to find out more about this, or, or what more is there to learn on this this theme? So I thought, aha, let's go and ask uh, Venerable Mahakachana, because uh, Mahakachana, the Buddha gave, occasionally gave titles to his um, disciples. So Venerable Sariputta was the uh, the, the one who was um, most accomplished in um, explaining subtle aspects of Dhamma. Mahamogalana was the most ex- uh, accomplished in psychic powers for the monks. Upravana was the nun who was most accomplished in psychic powers. Uh, Sister Kema uh, was the, uh, the nun who was most accomplished in explaining the Dhamma and so on. So Mahakachana had the title of the one who was the most skilled at explaining in detail statements of the Buddha made in brief. So they thought, aha! The Buddha has made a short, cryptic utterance, and we've got Mahakachana in the monastery. Let's go ask him. So they went to to visit Mahakachana, and uh, they recounted that statement that the Buddha made and said, what did he mean? What did the Master mean by this? What did he have in mind when he made this statement? So then Mahakachana gives this wonderful discourse uh, about perception and, and attachment and conceptual proliferation. So, uh, so when the, the, and he uses the example first of all of, of seeing, he said, so the, uh, <coughs> when the eye perceives light and there is the arising of eye consciousness, the three uh, of those things coming together makes eye contact. So passa, con- uh, eye contact. And uh, so, with contact, that sense contact, there arises feeling. And feeling, then, uh, with, the, uh, with the arising of feeling, that conditions the arising of sanya, or perception. Then sanya conditions the arising of vitaka. And so vitaka is thinking. So what, uh, what, uh, when the contact arises, that causes a feeling, pleasant feeling, painful feeling, neutral feeling, Vedana. And then the Vedana condi- uh, conditions the perception, the perception of, say, red color, blue color, uh, tall shape, short shape, distant shape, um, close-up shape. The, the initial... Um, the cognizing of the visual object is the uh, sanya. So that's not conceptual. So the, in, in terms of physiology, neuroscience is the uh, after the impulse, the, the electrical impulse has gone down the optic nerve and um, reached the brain. Then uh, uh, and uh, there's an initial uh, sort of instinctual. Uh, the recognition of that impulse as something that's that's uh, pleasant, attractive, or dangerous, uh, 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 that's unattractive, or is neutral, and then the the mind forms a, a more complete sense of this is red, or that's blue, or this is green, this is yellow, this is tall, this is short. So it, uh, that perception forms. And then quickly after, you have the vitaka, which is the, the thought which says, oh, that is red, or that is brown, or that is far away, or that is close up. So the mind forms the perception, and then the vitaka comes in and, and puts it into words. And then the vitaka then conditions conceptual proliferation. The thinking then conditions conceptual proliferation. So that, uh, that uh, might say, oh, that's... Um, 
Uh, that's a red color. That's a really ugly red color. Why did they choose that kind of a, a, a color for, for the floor in, in, in this, uh, this floor covering? That's a, that's a really ugly red. You know, uh, I've got a friend who's got a cloth shop well, who sells mats. It's got a much, much more uh, spiritually conducive kind of floor covering. And, uh, you know, I should uh, track down their address and uh, give it to the, the people who run the, the, uh, Balaji Nigroda Arama um, and uh, and uh, yeah actually yeah, my friend he, he's got a good business they might be able to sell them a few carpets and maybe yeah, he'd give me a commission and <laughs> this is Papancha so it starts off you know, the the light hits the eye um, the the initial per perception and it's kind of interesting that you have the feeling of pleasant painful or or neutral, that feeling is there before the mind has even created the idea of, or created the, 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 the perception of red. That this is like, uh, because our perceptions, hearing, seeing, smelling, tasting, touching, thinking, they are the, uh, our inheritance of, uh, of the, the whole animal realm that we've, that we've descended from, and so that they are the the, the things that you need to know in the animal world are is it going to eat me? Can I, uh, can I eat it? Or uh, can I mate with it? Is, it, or is, it, uh, is this going to invade my territory? Do I have to defend my territory against it? These are the kind of things that the mind needs to know. Even, our, even like little monocellular amoebas you know, like a, a single, a single cellular creature will detect. Can I eat it? Is it going to eat me? Uh, you know, is it? Uh, is this going to invade my my territory? So that these are very, very powerful instinctual responses. But uh, this whole process then uh, happens very, very quickly. And as Mahakachana was explaining it, he said so that uh, the. Uh, the perception, the sanya conditions thinking, and then the thinking conditions conceptual proliferation. And with that papancha, that conceptual proliferation, then that gives rise to what uh, in Pali is called papancha sanya sankar, which is uh, the whole multitude of the thoughts and perceptions and feelings that um, that arise and beset the, and, and sort of uh, pressurize the heart. And it's a, a kind of complicated way of saying that feeling of me in the world and a, a, and a tension between the two, me in a state of, of tension in the world, me threatened by something the world's going to do to me, or resenting what the world is always doing to me, or me chasing after something that the world is promising me, um, that there's a, a, a sense of, of pressure or tension between the, the you know, me and, and the world. So there's this, that's the fulfillment of that, uh, that process. And when I exist in a state of, of tension with the world, um, then often it's because um, that person doesn't uh, agree with me, they've got something that I want, I've got something that they want, um, I'm afraid of what they're going to do to me, um, I want to, to do something to them, so that that uh, when the mind believes in those, those perceptions and gets lost in them, as the Buddha said, this is the, uh, the cause of, of, of people taking up weapons, taking up cudgels and clubs and lapis to uh, fight and argue and uh, dispute with each other. So that that um, simple process demonstrates, uh, and not just, thing, not just where the, the mind gets into a, an argument with another person, but it, uh, as you can see in the course of the meditation, uh, how you hear a sound, a particular bird, or you hear somebody cough, or you, um, you hear a particular piece of music, or you have a sense, uh, you know, a painful feeling in your, in your knee, or you see somebody's, uh, uh, the, uh, the shawl somebody's wearing, and you think, oh, that's a beautiful shawl. Well, where did she get that from? That's really great. I want, I want one of those. Or, or you hear somebody coughs and you go, that cough sounds really bad, you know, he needs to go and see a doctor. Well, actually, I'm a doctor, so maybe I should, 
I should put my card by his his uh, his uh, meditation seat so that he'll know that he's got some medical help if, if he needs it. <laughs> so that the the mind runs away, and gets caught up in its own stories. It creates these these stories and entanglements. So that particular sutta, the Honeyball Sutta, and then it, it's talking about how people get into arguments, but it's also create it's also spelling out how we create complication and confusion and the sense of of me in a state of tension with the world uh, and that is all fed through this <coughs> un unmindful unconscious process of, of uh, conceptual proliferation and attachment to to perceptions just uh, to finish off the account in the sutta then so then mahakachana spelled this all out and described it in detail to the, the Sangha, and then, uh, uh, as was his, uh, his job, uh, Ananda uh, then took this uh, account to the Buddha and, and uh, recounted it to the Buddha, and the Buddha said, well, and then Ananda asks, so did uh, Venerable Mahakachana, did he speak well, or did he speak badly? Did he describe this as you, you would have done, uh, you know, when he he made this explanation based on your very short statement. So, did he get it right, or was, it, or was he wrong, or what is the the, the, the Buddha's uh, point of view on this? And the Buddha said, uh, Mahatmya explained it exactly as I would have done myself, and uh, this is a a, a, a very uh, wonderful and masterful um, discourse. And then that's when Ananda. Um, uh, described it as a, like a sweet morsel, and the Buddha said, "Yeah, we can call it the sweet morsel, the honey ball discourse." So this is a very helpful uh, uh, process to to be aware of, um, and uh, to have a, 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 a clear little map of how that works, because the with meditation and. Uh, as we can we can see when we find ourselves getting lost in diagnosing somebody's cough we're wondering where someone's got their shawl from or being convinced that someone is um, say, uh, determined to interrupt your meditation by, by um, uh, moving on to your you know, my walking meditation path <laughs> that uh, the uh, uh, that you've sort of claimed ownership of and to to be able to recognize well i the the eye sees a visual form i see the, the <coughs> particular shawl i hear a sound someone coughing or i see the someone on my walking meditation path and then that simple sense contact through that rapid process of the, of the mind um, taking that simple sense object, a sound or a feeling or a sight, and then creating the story around it, getting lost in the story, then it's, um, I've got to treat that person, who, you know, who's that idiot, that awful thief on my path, you know, where did she get that one, that beautiful shawl from, I, I, my, life is incom my life is not complete until I can get one like that. You, uh, you realize that it just began with a sound, began with a, a color, began with a, a perception of somebody in a particular spot on the grass. And if you, if you trace that back, to the, oh, it was to, from the state of agitation and, and conflict and tension that your mind is in, you, you realize, oh, it began very, very simply. It was not that person in, you know, taking over my space or... Uh, that feeling began with just seeing. It was uh, it was very simple. But the the further that whole process goes along, then the more it goes from simplicity to complication, to that sense of of uh, confusion and distortion. So then, uh, one of the statements that the Buddha makes in a different discourse, he says, "Apapanchan papancheti," don't complicate the uncomplicated. It's a nice packet. <laughs> you, put, you can make a T-shirt for that one as well. Don't complicate the uncomplicated. 
so that in the in the meditation when you see the mind getting lost in its stories and, and getting drawn into the mental um, chatter, the judgments of liking, disliking, um, loving, hating, approving, disapproving, then to, uh, to help the mind to let go, if it's particularly caught into a certain story about some tale about a family member or about your business or your studies or your health or your a, 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 like a local drama of some kind to to notice how the mind is drawn into that story and, and if it's um, if you say to the mind you know let go it's just a, it's just a story no oh, this is a real problem I've got to sort this one out. Uh, this is a this is a real this is not just an ordinary desire this is a real desire I've got to have you know, the world I, I'm incomplete until I've got that sure or I've got to I should I must so that if there's a particular sort of strength or tension to that then it can be a very simple and, and a helpful exercise to say well where did where did this come from where did this argument come from or where, where did this issue come from what what triggered the fact this is a, a problem or an issue or a, a thing in my mind right now so you can uh, do a little exercise of following it back recognizing the train of thought uh, you know, as it uh, occurred so you know, there you are inve uh, investing in your friend's uh, carpet company and making a profit from a, a new contract with the Balaji Nigrodharama maintenance <laughs> department. You think, wait, 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 wait. Yeah, I'm not looking for an investment. How did, I, how did I end up in this investment opportunity? So, okay, well, I was thinking about new carpets. I was thinking about my with my friend, and it was because I opened my eyes during the meditation and I saw the red pattern in front of me. So. That's where it began. So you, you trace it back and think, okay, when it was just the color of the, the floor, it was very simple. And then the mind started to get uh, absorbed into that, uh, the, the, the story and the whole um, set of proliferations around that. And then it got more and more complicated, more and more personal. And so it's got me who's got to do this or wants to do that or. Uh, I, I absolutely have to. I have to get my phone. Make a make a phone call. I have to, you know, talk to Arpan and get my get my phone out of uh, out of the cupboard. And so, because I need to call my friend today, because you know, I have to get the factories rolling to get these new carpets out. <laughs> and, uh, you know, you might you might think I'm exaggerating, or maybe you don't. <laughs> but these these things have happened in uh, meditation retreats uh, and you know, in, amongst members of the Sangha as well. Someone is not exactly ready to murder somebody else, but uh, that uh, they, uh, uh, on a 10-day retreat just this, this year, I was leading a, 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 um, this retreat, and someone had a particular place in Amravati where they, they always did their walking meditation. Like they'd been coming for, for nearly <coughs> 35 years, yeah, ever since Amravati opened in 1984, they came on the first retreat, and that's always been their walking meditation path, that spot. And then they come out, and there's someone else. Yeah. Someone is on my path. And I, as I would say, they weren't exactly ready to murder, but here's someone who's been meditating for 40 years, 35 years coming to retreat at Amravati, and someone's on their path. And this rage arises. Like, it's my path. You know, they don't own Amravati. They don't. <laughs> you know, they have no statutory rights over that particular piece of ground. But the mind creates a story. It says, "That's my path." And some other innocent meditator says, "Oh, oh, that's this, this really nice, well-worn path." And that, oh, that, that bloke who always uh, walks up and down here, well, he's not around. Oh. Okay, well, oh, you know, I'll use this one. This is a this is a nice spot. Why not? <laughs> so that uh, 
I am not exaggerating the, uh, uh, the kind of the degree to which this happens. Also, it's not just modern times. You know, the, 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 um, in the Dhammapada commentary, the uh, uh, one of the verse, one of the uh, uh, stories that go behind the the uh, the, the verses about um, heedlessness is uh, starts off with a. Uh, a young novice, a teenage novice, fanning his uncle, who's a terror, and is giving a dhamma talk. And so, uh, the um, and in those days, before electric fans, then you have a a, 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 a punker <laughs> a, a, The novice would have a fan. He stand beside the terror and he'll fan uh, them to keep them cool and keep the mosquitoes away while they're giving a teaching. So this teenage novice is standing there, and uh, he's, he's, I guess his uncle's dhamma talk was not particularly fascinating, as his mind started to wander into story-making. And he's standing there, and he says, well, yeah, I've been a, I've been a novice for about, was it two and a half years now? And we're getting near to the end of the rains, and well, you know, I'm 18 years old now, and... Uh, well, that uh, you know, I, I really don't think I'm going to be a monk for the whole of my life, really. Uh, so that uh, if I'm not going to be a monk for the whole of my life, I should start thinking about my future. Now, well, I'm 18. Eh? That's already pretty old. But people get yet married pretty young in my village. And well, that girl that I used to see, uh, she was ah, oh, well, maybe she's not, maybe she's married already. That would be a real disaster. But you know, but if she wasn't, then maybe if I, as soon as I get to the end of the rains retreat, then I can disrobe and. I'll, get back to the village and then you know if she's free I can just make that uh, make it clear to the family that we'd be a really good match to get married to her if she hasn't been married to someone else already and and then you know she's uh, you yeah, know she's a very nice girl she's from the other she's from the next village and uh, and uh, but the families know each other and they could arrange that really uh, really easily and then and then we get married and then uh, that would be really nice. And we have a little farm and some chickens and some goats. And, you know, the goats, they're kind of difficult, but yeah, it's good. Goat's milk is really nice. I think we should really uh, just have uh, maybe half a dozen goats. And then, uh, and then you know, well, we get married. And then, of course, we have a family straight away. And then, well, then uh, well she probably wanted to go back to her home to, to have her baby if, uh, you know, when she gets pregnant. So then, then we have to kind of make the journey. Her village is a few miles away, but well, we could take some of the goats along to... To, uh, to help provide, you know, with goat's milk while we're making the journey because, you know, that's really useful to have if you're pregnant and and, uh, and so then, uh, but then, you know, those goats, they're really badly behaved and, and, you know, they kind of, they go off this way and go off that way and they kind of run into the ditch and they have to kind of whack them with a stick and then just as he's halfway into, this is an accurate rendition of the story in the power part of commentary, just as he's imagining whacking the goats to get them back on the path, he hears this voice saying, hey, hey, he said, wow, this goat's talking. And he said, said goat, what do you mean this goat's talking? I'm your uncle, I'm a Mahatera, you know. And suddenly he realizes he's, he's standing behind his uncle, standing him, he's been hitting his uncle with the hand, <laughs> instead of the, the, his imaginary goats on the way to, with his imaginary wife to have her imaginary baby in the imaginary <laughs> next village. So uh, no, this is uh, the... Um, an account of uh, the nature of heedlessness getting getting lost in, in your thoughts. So I recommend this uh, this uh, practice of tracing things back, and, and then when you when you realize, oh, it just started off with a with a thought. Is that you know, oh, only another uh, <coughs> three weeks to go in the rains retreat, you know, or it starts off with a you know, seeing a red color, or you hear a bird, or reminds you of the birds you used to hear in your grandmother's garden. And then off you go. They trace it back, and, and then you realize, oh, it's just a sound, it's the color, just a feeling. That's all. It was completely uncomplicated and non personal. And then the further down the track it goes, then the more personal and complicated it gets. And then as you follow, as you sort of trace it back to its root, to its origin, then to, to see how uh, untrustworthy that perceptual process is and how easily we get lost.
Well, another of the different theme that we were that came up in the um, questions today, and talking about uh, wise reflection, Yoniso Manasikara. Um, and I mentioned that this is one of the four conditions for stream entry. So this is an interesting area to, to reflect on. Uh, stream entry, uh, probably most of you are familiar with, this is the first level of enlightenment and is um, something that is a, a very a worthy and achievable uh, goal in, in uh, one's lifetime. And the, um, the characteristics of a, a stream enterer, uh, or, the, or, the, or the, so the characteristics of stream entry um, that are, are say, within the, the, the field of the Buddha's teachings and what, uh, how it's described in the suttas is that where if the mind has reached the, this spiritual turning point of stream entry, it means that, uh, that uh, there's no more than a, a total enlightenment is guaranteed within seven lifetimes. The gates to the lower realms are closed, so that if uh, that uh, if uh, that being is reborn, there it's impossible for them to be reborn in the animal world or the ghost realm or the or the hell realms. So they'd be born as a human being or as a deva in the, uh, in the future, and uh, so the uh, the. Um, uh, the, the degree of suffering that one is going to experience if, if one has, uh, if the mind has reached the level of stream entry, is far far less than if one hasn't. So the, the Buddha gave a number of very in, uh, evocative descriptions. He, he reached down, he scratched the ground, and said, "What do you think, monks? Uh, what is what is the greater in quantity?" The amount of, of earth under my fingernail, or the great earth itself, the, you know, the planet that we're sitting on itself. So, Venerable Sir, the amount of dirt under your fingernail is very small, and the great earth is very, very large. <laughs> so even so, uh, the, uh, the amount of suffering that one who has, who has reached the breakthrough can expect to experience in the future is comparable to the, the, earth under my, the dirt under my fingernail. Whereas the suffering that one who has not made the breakthrough can expect to experience in the future is comparable to the great earth. So he was a genius at coming up with these very impactful similes. <laughs> and he goes through a whole list of like, uh, what is greater in, in, in quantity, the uh, five grains of sand or the Himalayan mountains? Well, sir, you know, five grains of sand is a very small quantity. <laughs> The Himalaya, the great Himalaya, uh, Himalaya is very large. Even so, uh, the, the suffering that uh, one, one who has made the breakthrough uh, can expect to experience in the future is comparable to five grains of sand, and the suffering that one who has not made the breakthrough can be uh, compared to the, the whole Himalaya. They are. Uh, it is uh, you know, much uh, vastly, it's vastly greater. It's, it's much, uh, much, much larger by uh, Many many degrees of magnitude. So the uh, so stream entry is uh, uh, so something that is realizable within this lifetime and something to, to aim for um, as a, particularly as a lay practitioner. This is a, a sensible, uh, a doable, uh, say a goal to to be looking towards. And the I would suggest that. Uh, and uh, as the, the Buddha emphasizes, you know, if you want to, if you want to stop suffering, this is <laughs> really uh, 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 wise to aim for this depth of, of insight and this uh, quality of, uh, say, understanding and, and liberation. And so the, the four conditions for, that are supported to, uh, to uh, realizing stream entry First one is Sapurisa Sangseva, which means associating with good people. So here you are, spending your time with other good people. So far, so good. So what you define, how you define a, a, a Sapurisa, a good person, is obviously open to interpretation. 
But a good person is one who lives in a moral way, a person who is trustworthy, who is reliable, someone who uh, loves what is wholesome and inclines away from what is unwholesome, someone who uh, is a, who delights in concord uh, rather than delighting in conflict, you know, someone who is uh, not um, uh, driven by worldly obsessions and uh, aversions and opinions, but someone who is, uh, their life is guided by uh, Say concern for what is noble, what is what is helpful, what is what is liberating. So saparisa sankseva, associating associating with good people. Then the second one is uh, satama savana, listening to the good dhamma or listening to the true teachings, good teachings. So hopefully you have the opportunity here to have some dham, dhamma savana to. Listen to the teachings. Uh, so this is uh, not just the Buddha sort of promoting his own product, <laughs> but saying, you know, this is if you, in order to uh, say change the way of seeing the world from your habitual self-centered views, your your uh, the opinions that you've received from your family, from your education, from your society, from the uh, uh, the people that you live with and work with, and to bring your your views and your attitudes into accord with a more profound and uh, realistic uh, spiritual qualities, then you need to get some information. You need to have some other input. If, if you just spend time around people who have uh, their own worldly opinions, their own worldly values, their own worldly obsessions, and if, or if you fill your mind, what you read, what you listen to, um, is a, a material that is just going to um, stir your mind up, make you more excited, make you more irritated, make you more opinionated, or just help you fill your head with facts that are not uh, helpful or liberating, then it's, it's not, you haven't got the information that you need to, to really change your heart. So sadhamma, uh, so finding the um, uh, the information, the, the the teachings that give you an opportunity to really change your heart, change the way the mind sees things, to to reframe the nature of your experience and to understand your your life, your body, your mind, your world in a in a new way. Then you, you need verbal input. Um, I don't think there's any instance in the whole of the Pali Canon where someone achieves uh, uh, enlightenment without any kind of Dhamma instruction. Now, there's a lot of people who get enlightened or, uh, uh, in, the, uh, uh, in the stories from the, the, the suttas, but you know, in some way, shape or form, everyone who is... Uh, who realizes enlightenment in the various different stages, it's through hearing the teachings or being uh, yeah, a, a, a close to to, uh, uh, to others or receiving a... That's not always a, a verbal teaching, but sometimes it's a, a visual teaching. Uh, uh, that uh, seeing some... Uh, uh, seeing the... Uh, one of the great disciples uh, uh, as they walk along, or um, and there's the uh, story of um, the Arahant nun, uh, Sister Kema, it was when she was a, a queen, she was a, 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 one of the chief consorts of King Bimbisara, and uh, the Buddha, according to the story, the Buddha worked uh, uh, a miracle of psychic power where the, uh, a young woman in the, in the court um, who was started off looking extremely beautiful and, and uh, stunningly attractive and, and came up as, who was very fond of her own and uh, proud of her own beauty you know, saw this young woman standing next to the Buddha fanning him and she thought oh, she's so much more beautiful than I am she's incredibly attractive who is that person she's extraordinary amazing incredible but then as she was watching her then she got older and older and older and older and older and kind of more kind of wrinkled and shriveled, and the hair turned white and fell out. And 
fell over and died. So uh, this was a, a non-verbal teaching <laughs> that the Buddha gave for uh, Kema. And uh, it was so powerful that uh, she became an Arahant right there. Uh, while she was still the queen, you know, with all her royal finery. And, and since she was married to King Bimbisara, who was a stream enterer, and uh, she asked permission to give up the royal life and go and live in the monastery. He had the wisdom to say, yes, Satu, 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 of course. No argument. And uh, so um, that was a, a non-verbal teaching. But I would say that it's, uh, it was still a definite form of instruction by the Buddha, if you, if you give uh, credit to those stories. So that uh, the importance of listening to the teachings or, or reading the teachings, drawing close to the teachings, is, is a very powerful um, the, uh, influence in our, in our life, very significant influence. Uh, there is a, also, uh, even though um, verbal teachings are often, you would think it's, uh, you, ne you necessarily have to be listening to someone else. There is, as I'm saying, I'm thinking of it, there is actually one instance in the canon where a monk becomes enlightened listening to his own Dhamma talk. So it was a verbal teaching, but he was, he was giving an explanation to his friends. And he became an arahant hearing his own Dhamma talk. So you can become in line listening to yourself. <laughs> but, uh, but we still have a standard of noble silence on this retreat, so don't try it until, until, until later. So then uh, the third of the four um, conditions that are supportive for stream entry is Yoni Sol Manasikara. So again, this is using your intelligence using your capacity to to think, and to reflect, and to explore the ability of the mind to recognize patterns, to see how cause and effect work together. Um, these, uh, this is the, uh, the uh, an essential element. And when the, the um, when the Venerable Sariputta, when he was a wanderer, he hadn't met the Buddha, but he saw the Venerable Asaji. Uh, walking on arms round um, through the, the town, I think, of, of uh, Rajkir. And he was very, very impressed by the demeanor, the sort of peacefulness and, and the composure of this, this wanderer. And so Sai Buddha stopped him in the street and said, uh, Who are you, friend? You know, you're, you're very serene and uh, peaceful. Your face is very uh, radiant. Yeah. Who is your teacher? What is your practice? You know, and, uh, Tell, tell me what it is that you've, uh, you've awakened to. So the Venerable Asaji said, well, I'm just a disciple, you know, you, I'm, I'm really nobody. <laughs> I can't explain anything, you, know, you, should, you should be my teacher. And then Sai Putta said, no, oh, the, you're, you're, you're here and I'm here, so please just tell me what you can. And then the Venerable Asaji uh, said, uh, gave a very, very simple teaching and he said, uh, of all the things that have a cause, the, the great monk, the Mahasamana, has described what the cause is, and all, uh, all things that, that have an effect. He's uh, described uh, what the effect is of, of all things that, that have been caused. This is the teaching of the great Samana, the great monk. So it's a very, very simple statement um, that he makes, and then uh, hearing that, you know, sorry, the wanderer, sorry, Putta, is. His given name was Upatissa, um, became a stream enterer right, uh, right there and there, and realized the, the deathless, hearing that, that simple teaching about cause and effect. So the, uh, the quality of Yoni So Manasikara, we were, we were talking about this afternoon, it's not just being intelligent. So you might think, well, I've got you know, three or four degrees, you know, I must have a, Twenty of Yoni So Manasikara, not necessarily <laughs> the amount of intelligence that you have or the number of degrees you have is not necessarily related to the amount of wisdom. Sometimes the the degrees and the the information that you have in your head can get in the way of wisdom. So it's uh, it's not just a, uh, having a clever mind, but it's a particular way of using the minds intelligence uh, and 
using that to uh, say, uh, be uh, ready to set aside um, self concern uh, and the habits of, of self view and, and to see how nature works the cause and effect relationship of the physical world, the mental world, the biological world. Um, to see how those work, uh, uh, independent of your own particular habits of conditioning and preferences, you know, the, your own habits of thinking of what is beautiful or what's ugly, what's, what should or should be or shouldn't be, to be able to set those aside and just to, to see uh, what the evidence of your senses is, is saying. So Yoni Soma Sikara, it's like wise reflection or investigation, uh, the word literally means uh, um, uh, uh, paying attention to the origin or the, the, the root of things. Uh, so it's, it's got a, a quality of exploration to it. And then the, the, the fourth one is Dhamma Nu Dhamma Patipata, practicing Dhamma in accordance with Dhamma. So that covers a lot. But uh, that what that means is so rather than practicing Dhamma in accordance with um, a, a obeying, a blindly obeying a teacher or practicing Dhamma according, according to your, um, uh, <coughs> your own particular preferences, uh, uh, but rather practicing Dhamma in accordance with Dhamma is uh, uh, say, not only uh, say having an idea of say developing concentration or, or keeping the sila, um, you know, uh, being generous, but uh, or developing wisdom, insight, but doing that in a way that's in accord accordance with dhamma. So that if you are practicing generosity in order to book a ticket to heaven, which is very certainly in Thailand is a very very common. Uh, process <laughs> that uh, many many of the the, the forest Ajahn spent a lot of time trying to persuade people that they are not they're not just the lottery <coughs> just selling lottery tickets <laughs> or, or selling people tickets to heaven but uh, rather the, uh, the the practice of, of Dhamma like we are talking about today that if you are trying to, to develop concentration through um, say annihilating your thoughts that you uh, that you're trying to wipe out your chattering mind just through sheer willpower or you're trying to force your posture to be absolutely you know, upright uh, through through willpower you, it's that would say practicing dhamma but not in accordance with dhamma you're practicing dhamma but in accordance with your own uh, your own will, or your own your own habit. Um, uh, <clears throat> if you if you find uh, I don't uh, most of you I don't know at all, but if if any of you find yourselves being morally judgmental, like you feel that you 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 know how people should behave, that uh, people should be you know, everyone should be honest, people should be uh, they shouldn't be corrupt, they should everyone should be vegetarian, people should uh, not invest in the in oil companies, and you know, this is morally reprehensible, and you have your good, noble principles for all your good reasons, um, and then you, uh, which are based on what is wholesome, or what is beautiful, what is uh, res respectful of um, the the sila, as it's written in the books, and as the Buddha explained, or as uh, you know somebody with any kind of ecological sense would understand. And then you take your 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 rightness, and then you use it. You use it as a weapon to attack other people. You know, and you you're using that kind of uh, moral judgment um, to say you, know, you shouldn't be like this. You know, you're you're really out of order. You know, you're you the way you speak is really uh, aggressive and really uh, un, you know un, you're you're exaggerating. You're, what you say is untrue. You're telling stories about people. Uh, you're gossiping, and uh, you're you're really out of order, and not noticing that the way you're talking to that person 
is really aggressive, <laughs> you know, really judgmental, and uh, that you, even though you might be able to to, to say you know, that you, um, yeah, you know, on this day you said this, and on that day you said that. When you said when you spoke to this person, you were wildly exaggerating, and when you spoke to this person, that wasn't true, and you are. You've got your facts correct, and that uh, yes, according to the standards of beautiful speech that are laid out in the Buddha's teachings, you are you are you've got all your information right. But uh, as my own teacher Ajahn Chah put it, you're you're right in fact, but wrong in dhamma. That you're you're correct. Yeah, that's yeah. People shouldn't do that. <laughs> People, if a person's going to be a, a, a sort of good Dhamma practitioner, then they shouldn't be uh, exaggerating, they shouldn't be uh, untruthful, they shouldn't be uh, aggressive in their speech. Uh, but you're uh, unconsciously, uh, you're, you're, um, you're using your own, your own speech as, a, as a, a means of attacking others, you're taking up the cudgel, the bluffy. You know, clobbering the other person with your rightness and your goodness. And you're becoming a militant promoter of peace. <laughs> so that uh, practicing Dhamma in accordance with Dhamma is, uh, is challenging. And, and, uh, and maybe uh, tomorrow I'll talk a little bit more uh, about this, and particularly in the way that we, we use effort in meditation. And you use uh, goal directedness by having a step. Even talking about having a goal of stream entry, part of me says, ah, that's probably not the best way of talking about it. <laughs> because we, the, how the mind takes a goal and gets obsessed with it. Um, so the very way that we make effort and we, or we give direction to our meditation and our, our spiritual practice um, can be out of uh, uh, out of harmony with Dhamma, that we can uh, we can make uh, <coughs> a very sincere and heartful effort, but if it's um, bound up with I and me and mine, then if I've got to practice. I need to develop, develop more concentration. I haven't got enough insight. I need to make the breakthrough. <laughs> I want to get fourth jhana. I want to get first jhana. <laughs> Any jhana will do. That I should, I must, I've got to, I ought to. Uh, all of that, even though it, it seems to be following the instruction of the teachings, that it, the very fact that it's, it's uh, got I and me and mine woven all the way through means that it ends up being practicing Dhamma but not in accordance with Dhamma. It becomes practicing Dhamma in accordance with self view. And then, so then. It's very tragic, but incredibly common uh, that all that sincere effort and commitment then gets distorted, you know, that uh, gets, gets uh, sidetracked. You find that you've left the highway. <laughs> you took that exit, the, the off-ramp, and you didn't really need to. You, you took the wrong turning. So that uh, I'll uh, probably talk a bit more about that uh, tomorrow, but... Uh, the, the, uh, just to finish on this uh, area of the, these four qualities supportive of stream entry, it's, uh, in, it's noticeable that what, what's there in those, those four is that it doesn't really talk in detail about sila, it doesn't talk about concentration, it doesn't talk about um, vipassana even. <laughs> it's that uh, they're there, uh, they're all um, to do with who you spend your time with, what you put your attention on to, uh, and how you use your mind, and, and the attitude that, that you have. These are these are the basic um, principles that, uh, that uh, are good to bear in mind. Sa, sapurisa sangseva. Who do you choose to spend time with? Do you choose to find sapurisas and spend your time with them? Other good people, or do you not? Sadhama Savana, do you choose to fill your mind with uh, with the news or with uh, you know, chatting with people on Facebook or uh, watching cricket? 
Oh, shouldn't get dangerous territory. Yeah, cricket is sacred territory. But you can spend an awful lot of hours involved with cricket, but you don't necessarily have to fill your, so much of one's life, even with something as important as cricket. That's dangerous talk. You know. Treading on, on thin ice. That, that, uh, so well, what do we choose to put into our mind? Then, Yoni uh, Sikara, how do we use our intelligence? What, what, do, we, um, what do we think about? Uh, how do we use our mind? Do we use our mind, our thinking, just to create more complication, or do we use our mind to, to liberate? Do we use our thoughts to help us understand the nature of thinking and perceiving, experiencing? Or do we use our thought to create anxiety, to, call, to create opinions and judgments? And then the, the last one, the, what's our attitude towards Dhamma practice? Do, do we look at the attitude with which we're working? Or are we just blindly following uh, a method? Uh, you know, the, well, the Ajahn said, uh, do this, so I'm doing it. Yeah. If the Ajahn said, do mindfulness of breathing, just stay with that and you'll be fine. That's what the Ajahn said, and I've been doing it for 20 years. <laughs> I've been following instructions. Well, yeah, but have, has that been in accordance with Dhamma, or is it just blindly following a, an authority or a book? What, uh, what is the attitude with which we're, we're working, and, and uh, are we considering that? So I thought I'd share those with you. They're, they're, I feel they're, they're useful principles to, to consider, and um, because it's not just the particular meditation method that the Buddha points to, but these other areas of our life that, that make a big difference, that uh, and have a uh, say uh, an influence upon the, the ground for our practice and our study, and create the, the conducive environment for liberation. So I offer these thoughts for consideration this evening. We can close with the chat. We can make a bit more light if people would like to. Let's Chant the Mangala Sutta. It should be here. <coughs> oh, there we go. So uh, let's uh, chant the suffusion of divine abiding. We can do that. Uh, this is on the Metta Karuna Mudita Upeka, the four Brahma Viharas. So this is page 42. We'll do the Pali version. Namaya Chaturapamanya Obasanam Karoma Se Meta Sahangate Nacheta Sa Ekam Visam Paritava Viharati Tata Dutiyam Tata Tatiyam Tata Chatutam Itiyo Amado Tiriyam Sabati Sabatataya Sabhavandha Lokam Meta Sahangate Nacheta Savipole Namaha Gate Sahangate na 
Sa vipole 